Let me introduce the person who's, who was really behind the whole thing, besides Nicholas Martini. It is William J. Martini, the Honorable William J. Martini, who is a U.S. District Judge. Um, what can I say? Villanova for his B.A., Rutgers University for his law degree. He has served and is, has an assistant prosecutor for Hudson County. He has been an assistant U.S. attorney for the District of New Jersey. He has been the commissioner, a commissioner of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, a councilman from the city of Clifton, a Passaic County freeholder, and a U.S. representative of the 104th Congress from 1995 to 1997. He is the nephew of the former Passaic Mayor, Nicholas Marcini. Martini, I'm sorry. Whoa. Okay. Let us welcome the Honorable William J. Martini. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, is this on, I think it's? Yeah, all right. Thank you. First, let me um, thank William Patterson University uh, and Ann Siliberti for putting today's program together. And I hope this is the beginning of an annual conference on local government, um, which is what we had discussed uh, previously. And that's what today's, uh, today's gathering is, first one of these conferences. Um, I want to thank also Professor Ebner and Professor Cohn uh, for their fine comments, and Professor Ebner in particular for bringing me down uh, memory lane. Uh, I must confess I can only go partially down memory lane. There's some 40 plus years between Nick and myself. Nick would have been 100. Uh, he was, uh, would have been 100 September 17th of this year. Uh, he died in 1991, and I really uh, got to know him well. I knew him as my uncle. But by the time uh, he was, well, when, by the time I was born, uh, he was already almost out of elected politics. Uh, I was born in 1947, and he was, uh, I guess, in his uh, final year as mayor of the city of Passaic. So I have few memories, uh, personal memories, of the elected part of Nick Martini's life, but I have many memories of his life thereafter, particularly when I began to share a law office with Nick in 1970 nine in Passaic, New Jersey. I had just finished working at the U.S. Attorney's Office as a federal prosecutor and I decided to go back to my hometown and he had some extra space. We had different practices, uh, but at least I had an opportunity during that, uh, those years to actually see him on a regular basis, talk to him and get to know him. He was already 73 at that point and I was 28 or so. And uh, so uh, to me, he seemed very young. Uh, I only realize now, I think, looking back, that he was 73. I guess as I'm getting older and tired, I look back and go, he was 73 and still doing all the things he did. And he did have four or five secretaries, and he did work three or four nights a week and Saturday mornings. And I think he did that because he truly loved what he did. And um, so to answer a few of the questions that Michael uh, uh, raised here this morning, and perhaps I can answer a few of them, uh, one being, you know, why did he leave elected office in 1954, 55, at 51 years of age? And certainly probably could have remained and gone on to other things. But he, uh, he first and foremost loved law. And a lot of people don't realize that. As much as he loved public service, he really loved law. And he got into political life at a very young age, at 27, and then stayed in it, or 31, I guess, and then stayed in it right until he was 51. And I know that because I remember when, in 1990, I was making the decision, should I run for public office as a councilman for the city of Clifton? Um, and I guess in 1990, how old was I then? Uh, uh, 41 or so years, 43 years old. Um, and I talked to him about it. And he um, made it very clear to me that uh, understand the commitment that you're taking on if you're elected and understand the importance of public service and understand that your life will no longer be your own and that you really he believed and i think it's good to remind people of this 
that public service is just that. You are now serving the people and much of your other part of your life would have to now take a second position and are you prepared to take that on? And so I think for him at 51, he came to the recognition that he was practicing law more. It was taking him, he was torn between law and the public service. He had done public service. I think he truly wanted to uh, go forward in his law career. He felt he had put it off maybe too many years and he wanted to go forward in his law career. Uh, and for those people who do know him personally, they know he was a very fine lawyer, an outstanding lawyer. And that was, I think, his first and true love uh, in his life was, in terms of career, was, was law. And he was very successful at that. As far as, um, you know, what we look back at anyone's life, you try to look at the influences and what helps to define that person's life. I think uh, first and foremost, it was my grandfather. Uh, knowing my grandfather, remembering him, he was truly a taskmaster. Uh, he came over from Italy, I guess, around 1900. Uh, came from a small town, uh, and I'm really relating not just an Italian immigrant story, but I think I'm relating an immigrant story, and it's an important story. Came from a small mountain town in Italy uh, called Fraina in the province of Abruzzi, which I happened to visit last year for the first time. Uh, it's a town of about a thousand people on the top of a mountain. Uh, he and his wife at that point, she was 17, I think he was 19 or 20, uh, migrated from that town to this country uh, for the primary purpose, as is true with so many immigrant parents, to have a better opportunity for themselves and of course their children. And having been in that town, I, 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 I looked and I thought about it when I was there, and I, it's good to think about it, about all of the immigrant experiences around the turn of the century. You know, today when our children go off to Europe or they go off to some place for a vacation, we say, call us when you get there, call us when you're leaving, make sure you tell us where you're staying, give us your phone number. These people left those towns and said goodbye, and it meant goodbye probably in all likelihood to their parents and to their relatives and to their friends. The likelihood of many of them ever going back and seeing uh, their relatives or their parents or their friends was small to nothing. And you have to think in terms of the strength and courage that they had. Uh, I think we take it for granted uh, the, the way the world is today, we communicate with everybody with phones all day and everybody. But these people left, took a 17, 19 day ship, had to travel from the mountains down to Naples, which was a four day trip on with the, whatever they belonged on their back. And, um, and this is so true of all the Eastern immigrants and immigrants at that time in the world. So I think his father, uh, knowing, remember my grandfather, he was a, a taskmaster. And he made sure his four sons, there were four sons, Nick was the oldest, Phil was next, my father was third, and then Tony was fourth, and he made sure each of them went to work every day after school at his shoeshine shop in downtown Passaic on the eastern side of Passaic, and he had a shoeshine. And then after school, after that, they could play for a while, and then they had to be home for dinner, and they had to stay in and study, and he made sure that they were studying, he and his, his wife, my grandmother. And each of them, uh, were, were successful because of that. And they got a fine education in the city of Passaic at the time. And, they, uh, but, and so the city of Passaic was also the other very defining influence in their lives, as it was in my life. Um, I went to Passaic High School in the 60s. But Passaic was a very diverse community. And that diversity, I think, was its richness. Uh, and I think they uh, shared of that uh, richness. And I know it helped to develop um, my, my uncle's outlook towards government service and politics. And as you saw, not only did he have a very strong following and, and, and uh, support in the Italian uh, in, uh, community, but he had a very strong support in the Jewish community, the Polish community, and that wasn't unheard of at that time. Uh, at that time, it was just accepted. This was your community. Sake was the community. It was made up of all these different groups, but it was the community. And, um, and I think that's how best you could define cities like the Sake and Patterson and Newark um, as uh, cities where the, when you grew up there, you just, these were your friends. You didn't know the differences. Uh, and in fact, I can remember even going to Sake High School in the 60s, early 60s, and it was a uh, mixture of every ethnic group you could think of. And, and the African-American community was just, just starting to come into the city of the Sake. And 
we were all in school together. I, we, none of us, I think, when we were sophomores in high school in that type of an environment, when you're in class together, uh, really dwell on the differences in the early 60s. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't see the differences. In fact, I can remember uh, an, an evening where I played football on a football team, which, which had a number of black players. And after the game, we, we said, well, where are we going tonight? We were going to go to downtown Passaic to some, uh, some affair at some uh, group uh, that was having a dance for the, for the teenagers. And I remember we all walked in, and then, then they, they weren't allowed in. I think that was the first recognition by all of us, the, the, the Irish kids, the, the Italian kids, the Jewish kids. Well, what do you mean? They're our friends, and, and they're not coming in? And, and it cre I remember that was the first time, I think, as a sophomore in high school, it all hit us that we go to school with them. We play ball with them. We shower together. We, we, and as a result of that, I can recall that we didn't go back anymore. The, the dances were, were over because the kids stood up and said, well, if they don't come, we're not going in it, so don't have your dances anymore. But it was that kind of a community. There was no sense in, 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 I think, as you get older, you realize there were all these divisions in the country, unfortunately, but there was no sense going to high school and growing up in the city of Passaic that the people were really different. They had different cultural backgrounds, which all of us shared in. And so I think that was one of the richnesses of Passaic, and I certainly know it defined his life as it helped to define my life. So. As far as Nick personally, um, he was a very formal man uh, of that school. I can never re I don't ever recall seeing him without a tie and jacket on. Uh, even in the office, he'd be working on a brief, writing a brief. He'd be sitting in the library with his jacket on and his tie and, and be writing a brief. He could be sitting home on Sunday afternoon. Occasionally, I would go over on Sunday afternoon and stop in to see him, and he'd be sitting in his sunroom. And his, uh, I think his one great enjoyment was watching cowboy movies. He, he, would, he would watch on Sunday afternoon while he'd have some work to do. He'd be watching a cowboy movie, uh, but he'd still have his jacket on, sitting in his chair with his tie on. I saw him down the shore. He had a property down the shore, uh, a motel that he owned that he loved for many years that he would go down to. And I'd only see him when he'd go in the pool without his tie and jacket. <laughs> he would go into the cabana and change and put his bathing suit on. And then afterwards, he would shower, and then we'd all go to dinner with his tie and jacket on, even on Saturday in the summer. So, um, but he also had some very good words of wisdom, a couple of which I'll share with you. Um, he said to me, as a young lawyer, he said, um, well, first he said that many lawyers, and I think you can apply this not just to lawyers, but that many lawyers talk too much and listen too little, and, uh, and maybe even do less, he used to say sometimes. But, you know, that's applicable, certainly could be applicable to politicians, but I think it could be applicable to almost all of us. Uh, and, a, you know, people tend to want to talk versus uh, listen, and uh, we all fall prey to that, I think, at different times, but he was a master at that. He, uh, in his quietness, would, uh, would be able to almost intimidate people, especially his adversaries in, in, in legal cases in court. He could go hours without saying anything. But then when he spoke, everybody would listen. So he had a very good way of doing that because he, he really believed that. And he also used to say that if you have nothing good to say, don't say it. And that was true in his private life as well. Uh, in his public life, of course, you know, that would be... Uh, you know, that would be understandable. But even in his private life, I rarely heard him talk negatively, even against his foes or, uh, you know, political foes or anything. He never, uh, would never really talk negatively. He would rather not say anything about them. And I rarely heard, heard him say a negative thing about even his most, uh, you know, strongest uh, opponents or uh, people who would talk about him. So I found that very admirable, um, in fact. Um, and then I, I, he was, um, in terms of government in politics, he was certainly of the old school. I remember in 1991 on my first political campaign, um, it was getting towards the end of the uh, campaign cycle. It was about a week before election, and he hadn't gotten involved. In fact, he wasn't, he was kind of sitting on the sidelines looking at me, I think, uh, kind of wondering how I was going to do, and, and, you know, and then about a week or two before he called me up one day and he said, uh, I have some time on, you know, um, tomorrow afternoon and I'd like to take you down to Botany section of Clifton 
where I used to know a lot of people, and I'll take you around and introduce you to some people. Now, it's two weeks before the election. I've already been out there for six months. <laughs> you know, I, well, so I said, I'll pick you up, uh, and we'll go. He said, fine. Now, he's 85 at that time, because he died the next, he died six, seven months after I got elected. So we go down there, and, and I remember he had um, some of my palm cards in his pocket, you know, and he, uh, and he and I, and he would take me by the hand. I was 43 years old. <laughs> and he would take me by, and he'd knock on someone's door, and he would walk in, and he'd say, excuse me, sir. And he goes, I'm Nicholas Martini, and this is my nephew, William, and I'd like to introduce us. And, uh, William is William, and he's running for councilman here in the city, and uh, I'd like to present you with his platform. And he, and he starts explaining everything, and he turns it over, this is what he promises he'll do, and and you know, and I'm I'm standing there today. People will like, here, take my five ten. <laughs> they uh, they had no patience like that, and so I saw uh, the personal, real uh, effort he must have made years ago, and um, and you know that how important that personal touch was. Unfortunately, all the people he thought he was going to introduce me to had long been gone out of botany, uh, and it was a uh, it was a touching uh, day for both of us, but. Uh, but that's the way he approached it, a very personal, um, and he had a great sense of fairness too, that um, I think people who knew him in Passaic uh, remembered that and knew that uh, he had a great work, work ethic and he was very loyal to his friends and, uh, and certainly fair. I also remember one other incident that uh, a lot of people don't know about. It is in one, of the, one or two of the articles that uh, Nick preserved all these articles, a lot of these photographs. and and all newspaper articles, he had a great way of saving things. He, um, he or his, his secretaries would clip out all articles about the sake, politics and him and everything. And he saved them in these volumes of books, which we now have here at the library, which we donated. Um, there must have been 50, 40 big books and other photographs and stuff. But in, those, uh, in that collection, uh, there are a number of articles uh, about an incident in Passaic that occurred in the 40s, I guess, when he was mayor. And there was not, and this was not politically motivated because there was not a large um, African-American community in Psyche at that time. It was just starting people, but not a very large. It was certainly not an influential voting block at the time. But there was this very capable you know, lady. Her name was Marion West, and uh, a black woman, uh, 17, 18, and 18, 19 years old, who uh, applied for a job. Uh, came to him and asked for a job in City Hall, and uh, she was capable, and he hired her and told her to go down and start working and whatever. And then uh, the next day, she came to his law office uh, and was crying and said uh, that the people there wouldn't give her a desk and they wouldn't give her, they said, you know, you're not, you're not gonna be here. Well, the story was, and it's, it was reported, that he left his law office and walked to City Hall with her that day as the mayor and uh, immediately sat her down, got her a desk, and, you know, and that was it. Marion, from that day on, remained a family friend of ours, uh, and her son, Jerry West, became a great good friend of mine, but it was that kind of thing that uh, it was just a sense of fairness, and, uh, and, and, and Nick, uh, uh, it's something that wasn't widely reported, but it was something he was most proud of, um, and, um, and he did. So, um, in closing, and then I'll be happy to take some questions. Um, I hit something. <laughs> uh, the, um, you know, the theme also is this urban, suburban, and I think one of the things you do lose in this suburban transition that the country has gone through is you lose some of that richness of the community and the diversity that we grew up with. I mean, and, and it has to do with, um, I went to a college that was not as diverse. I went to Villanova University. When I went there, it wasn't as diverse. And I always remember looking back at my Passaic High School experience and my Passaic experience as the one that probably influenced me the most and, uh, and uh, I think was the uh, better experience in terms of uh, not just educationally, but because of that interaction with so many different uh, types of people that you just grew up not really, you know, believing that there were any big differences between any of us. And I know Nick felt that way, and I think anybody who came from Passaic who had the benefit of that, or Patterson or Newark, 
uh, certainly uh, benefited from all of that. So again, I thank William Patterson University for the, uh, uh, this nice program and hope that hopefully this is the beginning of other good programs on local and state government. And I thank you all for being here. Thank you. Any questions, Ann, to any of us, sir? No, the Shirelles. Yes. Yep. I did. Well, they were they were seniors when I was a freshman. Uh, and um, how did that come about? They were doing an amateur show in, in the Sake Auditorium, uh, and one of their very good friends, uh, Judy, I forgot her name. Her mom was uh, involved with some uh, record company in New York, and. Uh, and so this young girl said to her mother, you ought to come to this amateur show. These girls are really good. And sure enough, mother came to the amateur show and said they are and brought them into New York. And they did their first record. And that's how it all began. But. Um, I still believe that the overwhelming number of people in public service and in private uh, corporate life are honest, trying to do the best they can. Uh, so I still believe that. Now, I think there's another factor here that we didn't have when we were growing up, and, and Michael might be able to uh, comment. Today, no matter everything that's done, it's immediate news. And then we have a cable news network, which is saturating us with you know, these stories 24 hours a day. And I think that's a new, relatively new phenomenon the last 15, 20 years. So that the impact on us individually is when something happens in the world, we think that this is like everything. And I think it's far more, has much greater impact and maybe is overemphasized because of that. I mean, whether it's a hurricane on the news for two weeks straight, you couldn't do that years ago because you didn't have modern electronic media. And it, so you'd get reports on it for 15 minutes on your nightly news, and then you'd put it away. And then maybe at 11 o'clock, you'd get another report, and then you'd put it away. Uh, so today, with modern media, uh, these stories have a life of their own. So you, you can walk around thinking the whole world is corrupt, or the, the heavens are falling in. Or, you know, uh, I mean, there's gloom and doom. If you, look, if you spend time in front of the TV, as mo a lot of us do, you watch it, you'll, you'll, be, you'll wonder what's going on. So I think that's a big factor in it. I really do. I think so when something corrupt happens, immediately it's on the news, but not just for a story for five minutes. It could be on the news for three, four days. And so we read about the public corruption in whether it's Monmouth County or this, or you know, and you'll end up reading about it, reading about it, and seeing it, and hearing about it. Um, and I think that could influence young people to think that this whole system is, is corrupt. And I mean, as a judge, I see the corruptness uh, in terms of before me uh, on a regular basis. But 
I, I still realize that uh, it's probably a, still a small number in comparison to all the people that are out there, whether in elected office or in government service or in, uh, in the corporate world. I mean, I think you have to put it in that perspective or try to. Yes. Well, as far as as far as public service, um, as far as far as public service, I think you have to really think it through and recognize what I said before that to do it right, it means serving the public, and it means a lot of time, energy, and effort, and a lot of sacrifices. And I think some people will get into public service and not realize there's these sacrifices, and then that might bring them to the edge. There's financial sacrifices. Oftentimes you can be in public service, you know, and, and you're not making half of what you might make in the private sector. And so that puts people on the border of getting close to the edge, uh, especially if they think they're, you know, there's an entitlement to this all. Uh, so I think you have to think it through as to why you're going into public service. You may not want to do it for your whole life. Uh, I don't think making a career in, you know, elected office is the best way. That's my own opinions personally. And in fact, uh, for me, that I remember when I was 29, I was asked to get involved in public life, and my uncle said to me, don't do it now. You're just getting out of law school. Try to become a good lawyer first and build up your law practice, because that way, if you serve and then it doesn't work out, and for me, after a while, it didn't either, you'd always have something to go back to, and you're not dependent on uh, just the next election or something. But I think in terms of public service, thinking it through and realizing it is really a service and it, you're, there's a sacrifice involved with it. If you're not prepared to do that, you're going to get yourself in trouble because you're going to try to find ways to make up for what you feel you're missing out on the private sector. In the private sector, you know, you have to be guided by um, your own good judgment. There'll always be, there's always going to be some temptations out in the marketplace, uh, whether it's the private sector or the public sector. And, uh, and, you know, this, this idea that, well, everyone is doing it, and therefore it's, it's okay, uh, is not the right uh, moral compass to be following. I think you have to follow the, um, you know, recognize that that's not usually the case. It may sound like everybody is doing uh, something uh, on the corporate management or something, but um, you have to trust your own good judgment. And hopefully that good education and what you're learning here will help you do that. commercialization of American politics, the marketing, the advertising, the, 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 the polling, um, you know, it, 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 
I, I think that's a factor, too, uh, in discouraging people who may see this as public service. That, you know, you really, and then people become obligated to, in order to pay those bills to, uh, to special interests. And, and so it, it's a vicious cycle, which I think is, is very tough. I don't, I don't know if that, I mean, I don't, I don't know what, what, part of what you might be addressing is part of what uh, Elizabeth was addressing. I mean, as we uh, diverse uh, out, there, it, was, it was much easier, I think, growing up in the city of St. There was a sense of community. Uh, and there was the suburbs of farms in Clifton and Wayne. And, you know, they had little towns and they had their little governments, but the big, the big uh, towns were, say, Patterson, Newark, and so those were the governing towns, and those were the towns that really, uh, the people, uh, there was a sense of civic pride and, and uh, commitment. And as you become more diverse and spread out, from the 550 municipalities that we have, um, it's harder, I think, to have a sense of community. Maybe some of the smaller towns still do, but I think it's harder. But as far as the campaign process today, I, I thought I'd add this. Uh, Elizabeth is absolutely right. You hear people say, well, why, why is there so much money in politics? You know, and how come there's so much money? Well, um, to do a mailer to the, to the uh, electorate, uh, what used to be 16 cents maybe 15, 20 years ago, today will probably cost you 67 cents, and that's a, that's a nothing mailer. And nowadays, because of cable TV and all the many um, media outlets to campaign, uh, you have to get on some of those media outlets, and they're very costly. So the, the amount of money, and I, wish, I think most people running for office wish they wouldn't have to go out and raise the kind of money you do today. But if you can't, then you can't get a message out. And, uh, and that's, that's your, pro you know, your problem. I, mean, I could think back to the election of uh, John Corzine and, and Bob Franks. I mean, there was an election in which um, Franks had little money, and Senator Corzine had a lot of money, and and yet it was a very close election. But if Bob Franks had some, you know, some uh, not not nearly as much, it could have even been closer, and it might have changed that election. But he had no, virtually nothing against a lot. And uh, I think in this election, not to talk politics, but just to talk uh, in this election, I think you're seeing a little bit of a difference. Both candidates have a significant amount of money, and maybe one has more than the other, but but enough money to get their message out so people can make an informed decision, if you want to call it informed. But you could try to see through whatever the uh, campaigns are. But at least there's enough to balance the one side that didn't exist in the first election. Uh, but money is a, is a, is a problem in, in, in elections. But it's, if you say take it out, then you have to say, well, the government should then subsidize the electoral process. And I don't think any of us would want you know, your tax dollars going to pay for political campaigns. Or you have to do what they do in Britain and open up the media markets uh, to free time, which I don't think the media markets here are prepared to do. Uh, so it's not a perfect world. I just want to add one point, one more point to this, um, which is something I write about in the book, um, which is I think that, that what you just said about the, all these new um, media outlets of you know, cable television and, and so forth, direct mail campaigning, all of that I think works against that sense of a larger public and a shared um, political community. Because in fact, what starts to happen is that the electorate gets very fragmented. Um, and this whole kind of market segmentation invades the political sphere. And so the messages that people are getting, they're being appealed to around very narrowly defined interests that, that actually set their interests against other people's. And speak, because they can be pinpointed very narrowly. You know, there's all this, this very complicated calculations of what cluster people are in. So they, people watch very different cable television networks. They read different newspapers, listen to different radio shows. So that, that public is also being fragmented.
I have just, you've provoked so many thoughts in my mind that I assume in everybody else's that I'll just take a, a stab, just make a few observations. One is that I think that some cities are doing better and some cities are not. I think there are very important differentiations there. Boston is doing pretty well. Lawrence, Lowell, New Bedford, I could go on and on and on, are doing terribly. And I assume that, that there would be um, I don't know the New Jersey situation well enough now. There is some revival going on in Newark, obviously, but Newark still has a lot of problems. And New Jersey cities, Connecticut cities, I'm like, you know, there. And so I do think there are, there, there are place cities that have been where, where capital is attracted because it, the, it's a, a city like Boston that has been able to do that, has its universities have been very important for Boston. Boston was in terrible shape in the 1920s through 40s, even to the 50s. Uh, and has had a, a new Boston revival, but it's still a fragile operation. Uh, and there's still, it's gotten to be so expensive that a lot of new um, corporate headquarters are moving out. Uh, a lot of people living in New ha Hampshire around in Massachusetts, but so that they're, it's, it's fragile. And just to point out that your own beloved Providence has revived around a downtown shopping center. You know, that, that's, that, that there is that, you know, at the center of the city has, was the building of a sort of suburban solution. So just with, would sort of want to make those. Um, I do think that you're right that globally the American sort of uh, post-war experience of increasing suburbanization is happening, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that some other countries do have an infrastructure that supports urbanization more than ours does. So that France, the country you know well, yes, there's suburbanization happening in France, but the cities are still very dynamic and there are lots of reasons for that, the tax structure, the, you know, just a lot of, uh, you could probably do better, my husband's a French historian, so I know about it some, but you could probably explain better, but so that it isn't just a question of an inevitability. There are things you do that favor urban over suburban or the other way. Do people want to? I, I would try to add to that, that going all the way back to the federal and state uh, and in 
embedded in our Constitution is the absence of the mention of sitting, uh, which was quite purposeful on, on the part of the founders of uh, Madison, uh, in, in particular, we can't blame Jefferson for saying that he wasn't there. Uh, but we, we have always had a, uh, an ambivalence as a nation about our state. Uh, and that ambivalence is, is not only a spiritual ambivalence, but it's also a constitutional ambivalence as well. And uh, yet, uh, on, on the positive side of it, as the Lisbon has referred to, we do have these cities. Uh, and she is quite right to, to say that it is not all cities, but a handful of cities that, that are showing you know, positive faces. Chicago has just gained population for the first time in a half century, but we would play that off. Um, and by the way, Chicago's population would have declined for it not for the new immigration in the 1990s. But we also have the, the circumstance that Detroit uh, fell under one million in 1990 for the first time since 1910. And now it's under 900,000, and now Detroit, which was the fourth largest city in 1950, is the 11th largest city in the United States, having slipped behind San Diego and also slipped under the 900,000 mark. Um, and uh, these have to do with what I like to think of as, as long-term structural economic waves that, that have affected uh, the nature of, uh, of, our, of our national economy. Uh, in the 1930s, late in the 1930s, the Roosevelt administration, just, just before it became um, absorbed by international crisis, did create a study group, the National Resource Recovery uh, Agency, or N -N -N -R -R -A, I think was its name, and they did do a study in 1939 called Our Nation's Cities. And they said that cities are absolutely imperative to the economic survival of our nation. But of course, no attention was paid to that report except by historians uh, in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, so you put your finger uh, on a, a very important issue. I will say on a hopeful note that, that the students that I encounter in suburban Chicago invariably want, believe that they want to live their lives in cities. Um, and, and their destination is Chicago or San Francisco or Los Angeles. One further point, when Mel, when, when we were teaching at, at Herbert Lehman College in the Bronx in the late 1960s, Together, and, and I was tracking the aspirations of our of our students there. They wanted to be in New Jersey. They wanted to be on Long Island, or they wanted to be in Rockland County, uh, New York, at the time. Well, the students here, by the way, want to be more rural and better suburbs. I have a and very few students want to go to the city of New Jersey. And I wonder if your students, if you surveyed them in 15 years, how many of them will still be living in cities, or if that is not a stage of life? I, I agree. Well, thank you both, all three of you, very, very much. I'd like to uh, invite you for lunch. Uh, those of you who registered uh, for the conference, the lunch is, we can go with Iris right out the door here. For those of you who didn't register and are coming back for this afternoon, the cafe is open on the ground floor. Uh, the building is open. There, it's a lovely day. You can go out on the terrace. Uh, and we will be meeting back here at 1 o'clock for our panel this afternoon, which will consist of Mayor Scott Romana from Wayne, Mayor uh, uh, Joey Torres from Patterson, uh, State Senator Nia Gill, and moderated by Ma Michael Aaron of NJN. So come back at 1 o'clock, and we'll see you then. Thank you.